From Chicago, welcome to Three Degrees Discussions. I'm your host, Mike Vasquez. This is a podcast devoted to the stories behind the innovators, entrepreneurs, and leaders in the 3D printing industry. But the moment you get into production, that's where the question of, hey, what are the production volumes that you care about? Is this going to be a recurring program? How much of runway? How much of, you know, what are your quality requirements and things like that? And, you know, there have been a lot of customers to where the answer is just no bid. Let, hey, we, you know, the done the analysis, we've done all that kind of stuff. It just is just a no bid. So there are a lot of programs where the sheer amount of development that's needed um, that has to get done it may not make sense for the service bureau itself. To- that was a Jay Krishnan. Jay is the research leader of EWI's additive manufacturing group and product owner of EWI's laser powder bed fusion practice. His responsibilities as research leader span business development, R&D management, and technology strategy of EWI's AM portfolio. His technical role is that of a systems engineer in additive manufacturing, working across materials, processes, monitoring and control, as well as data science. Before we get started, head over to www.3degreescompany.com and subscribe to the podcast. Remember, you can listen to the show anywhere you download your podcast, including Spotify, Apple, Amazon, or Stitcher. Jay, thank you so much for joining the show today. I'm excited for the conversation. Um, I think you're our maybe second or third EWI, at least affiliated person on the the podcast. We had Ed, who was a uh, former uh, EWI grad or alumni, I suppose, <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. But <laughs> yeah. um, thank you for joining. And I think one of the things that I'd like to, to start the show out with is give the audience a little bit uh, a flavor about kind of yourself in the early days, kind of where you're born, where you grew up, kind of what was your childhood like as you started on that path towards engineering? Sure thing. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for having me on this. So um, I, I was born in India, uh, but then we, my family, we all moved to the USA when I was a really small kid, um, lived here for like, I think nine years before uh, the family moved back to India. So I, at this point, actually of this year, I've spent um, equal number of years in India as well as in the USA. So I'm kind of, uh, you know, I, 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 I'm able to <laughs> balance both sides, both cultures. Um, so I did my undergrad in India uh, at the National Institute of Technology, Karnataka, uh, specializing in, in metallurgical and materials engineering. Um, I initially wanted mechanical, but as the way these entrance exams in India go, um, you are given uh, a branch of study. You don't really get to choose it. So metallurgy was given to me. And then over the course of time, I really made it my own. And I absolutely love this uh, branch of study. Um, then I came back to the USA in like 2016 uh, to pursue my master's degree. Um, and I landed up at Cornell um, there for two years. And uh, this is kind of how like I, I kind of fell into <laughs> additive manufacturing. Again, uh, there, there's a coin involved. <laughs> <laughs> in that story, but that's basically you know the early days. Uh, and then I came back to the USA and uh, started off at Cornell. So, and how did you like? How do they actually decide which field you go to? Was it like some like an entrance exam? You did a little bit better on that than than Bingo. someone else. Like okay. that, that's absolutely right. So if if you speak to anyone who's uh, done their you know, undergraduate degree in, in India or maybe even China or maybe other countries as well. Um, there's like this big grand entrance exam that everyone spends years studying for. And after you complete that entrance exam, you get a score and a rank and you are that rank, you are that number. Um, you might be the best, you know, nationally acclaimed violinist, but if your rank isn't good, then you can't get the branch that you want in the college that you want. So I picked my college (laughs) because my uncle and my cousin went there and they seen, and they turned out all right. So I was like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll go here. (laughs) Not bad. And then, uh, Effectively, I, I got I got the branch. Like I got metallurgical materials engineering. Um, I had the option to switch to mechanical, but I actually really enjoyed and appreciated it, the research that was being done and the field of study overall. You know, I remember the, the parent of one of my best friends actually kind of convinced me to stay in it by saying, "Hey, silicon is reaching its limits. It's up to you to figure out what's happening next." And I was like, you know, like he breathed fire into me, and I was like, "Oh yes, absolutely, I'm gonna do this. I have to I have to figure out what the answer is." So that kind of set me off in a couple of directions, but that's how I actually stayed. <laughs> Did you have any like when you were kind of growing up? Were there any projects or like things you like to do like work with your hands that like kind of pushed you in? like uh, just more interest in, in that direction or was oh, it yeah. kind of 
Absolutely. Uh, I, I've, I've honestly, I've always been a, a window seat kind of person because I always love seeing the the airlines and the flaps moving up and down and how the engine uh, and nacelles open up. Um, that has always captured my interest, and I always knew that I wanted to stay or do something related to planes. I've always been a, a, a you know a fighter plane nut as well. So the moment that a connection between material science and aerospace was made, I was pretty sure that this is what I wanted to do. Um, <laughs> and uh, from a hands-on perspective, really, to be honest, I wasn't that much of a hands-on person. I just liked science. I was very good at physics. Um, and I just kind of fell into it, really. <laughs> and so you kind of finish your undergrad, you go over to Cornell. Kind of what were some of the things you were working on while you were there? Yeah. So when I reached Cornell, right, we we basically have like this, you know, you have to figure out what your thesis project is or and figure out your, your area of research. I was pretty sure at that time, I, I was just coming off the back of like a, a particularly grueling summer internship um, uh, where I did a lot of like deep research, you know, pie in the sky stuff, which would, would never probably get realized only 20 years from now. And, and after that, I was like, you know, I really need to work on something more industrially relevant. So there were options to do your research project, either with the, uh, like a professor and research group or do it with industry. And so I picked the industrial option and basically uh, a couple of companies came presented and we had to go for interviews and so i interviewed with a bunch of companies and it came down to two options either i was uh, gonna work on uh, developing lithium-ion batteries or i was going to work with uh, you know a plucky startup in upstate new york um, who wanted to do production in uh, metal 3d printed components nice, nice. and <laughs> and basically i flipped a coin because both of them were super exciting areas really really like fast growing industries and uh, and I couldn't really decide between them so I literally flipped a coin it came as heads and that's it metal am it was awesome and so what was that first internship what was that first job experience like in 3d printing yeah so I was, I was working at this company called Encodema 3d which is a, a contract manufacturer uh up in uh, upstate New York near Ithaca so I started off as an intern and you know the first uh, task that I had was basically streamlining um, the uh, basically our, our powder characterization and, and powder quality system. So they were going through like, you know, hundreds and hundreds of pounds of metal powder per, per week. And part of it was to understand, hey, the powder that's coming in, do we have quality metrics to define uh, what good powder is, what bad powder is? And how do we measure this? And how do we track powder quality as the powder is being reused? Right. And so part of it was, you know, this was back in 2016. So there weren't a lot of, uh, you know, publicly available standards and guides associated with it. So part of it was to really kind of knuckle down and understand, hey, what are powder characteristics? What matters? What affects flowability from a particle size distribution perspective, moisture, chemistry, all that kind of stuff. So basically got that system wrangled together um, and then handed it over to quality. And then by then I actually, uh, you know, uh, got the opportunity to, to co-op there full-time. Um, so, you know, I was doing school and interning there, kind of doing my project and then got the opportunity to co-op. So I joined as an intern. And at that was when, once I joined as a co-op, that's when I started working on, um, you know, working in front of the machines, doing parameter development on things like, you know, cobalt or chrome coated tungsten, tungsten rhenium, and a couple of like, you know, exotic alloys like that. And very quickly I got promoted to material scientist because the old material scientist left. <laughs> And so I was like, oh, great, I'm a, I'm a co-op, I'm still in grad school, and I got promoted to being material scientist at this company. So it was a pretty quick, steep learning curve. So that's how I kind of got really bedded into, um, you know, materials engineering and process engineering for laser powder bit fusion, um, which directly impacts a, a production company. <laughs> and so can you talk a little bit about... Um kind of what a production 3D printing company looks like in terms of different job roles. So you were the first or kind of a material, like you're the materials guy, but like, what, what is the business? Like what, how does it work? Like who's involved? Like what, what do you do on not, not specific yeah. projects or anything, but like, what does that mean? Yeah. So great, great question. So for most of these service bureaus, they make money when they print parts and ship completed parts uh, to customers. Right. And the term complete, might be, hey, it's printed, but then it has to go through these steps, such as, hey, it needs to be surface finished, it needs to be machined, it needs to be inspected, may need to be heat treated, maybe we need to emboss, you know, a serial number on the side, and so on, and all that stuff are, are you know, requirements that 
end customers, or we call them OEMs, request, right? Your big aerospace primes, you know, your, your GEs, Lockheed's, Boeing's, they may have internal capabilities, but they also, you know, um, you know, contract out manufacturing to other suppliers. So production companies, service bureaus, again, are just suppliers and players in, in, in you know, this entire supply chain. And our, our role was basically to print parts, print good quality parts, make sure they meet the requirements that are needed, and basically ship them to the customer. So everything over there was focused on speed, 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 and quality. You know, get parts out, get them out quick. So my role it was focused where I was, um, you know, playing in between quality. Where hey, sometimes in order to define what the spec is in the internal spec, like hey, um, how do we know that this machine is actually functioning properly? What is our calibration methodology? What is our qualification methodology to you know after a machine's been serviced or if a machine's been moved? How do we make sure and ensure that the that the machine is producing good quality material and we are ready to go back and start off with production? That's one part of it, you know. So I wrote specs on those lines. Um, then on the you know um, like development side of things, there might be a customer saying that hey, I need five thousand widgets to be printed out of you know a three sixteen uh, material, but I need these particular mechanical properties to be hit. Right, so we have the end requirements. So we need to go and say, all right. So what do we have? We have the standard, you know, parameters off the shelf. We're going to use that. There's a standard AMS heat treatment for 316. We'll try that, and then we'll, you know, machine them into tensile bars, and we'll test it and see what these tensile properties are. And then you realize, oh, you know, it doesn't actually meet the requirements. So where can we actually change up things a little bit? So associated with that, you know, doing parameter development to get better properties or doing a cheap treatment adjustments to get better properties. You know, there are a bunch of things you can adjust, but there isn't a lot of wiggle room, especially in production. Because if you make a lot of changes upstream, that might result in a lot of problems for you downstream. <laughs> so things like that. So that, that's another type of thing that, that was done. And then the third real role that I played was in research and development. So, you know, I was like the one-man research and development team if there's a cool idea that we wanted to test out, because it was the early days of AM, not many people had machines. And so there were a lot of customers who were interested in getting parts printed out of new materials, exotic materials. You know, they'd be asking, hey, can I, can I, you know, print this thing that looks like an antenna on a non-metallic substrate? Or can I, you know, print intentionally print porous parts, you know, where I can grade the porosity. So these are research and development questions. And so whenever we'd find, you know, some open time on a machine, I dive in and then get this experiment carried out and then we'd have a result. And basically that result would, you know, help form the basis of a presentation or a paper, something which just helps us, you know, uh, brand and, you know, in increase our visibility in, in you know, in, in the marketplace so that people are like, oh yeah, these people know what they're doing. We should go yeah. speak to them. <laughs> I remember a lot of the tables and a lot of good material science stuff you guys put out a um, number of years ago with that. So it, it worked. I definitely saw it. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> uh, so along those lines, I mean, one of the balances that all the service bureaus seem to have is the flexibility of 3D printing means that a lot of people are going to throw wild geometries, wild parts, and different concepts at you. And it's often not going to be the same day to day. And so from a quality perspective and a material science perspective, how challenging is that to manage when yeah, sure. Like there's materials, things that you want to keep consistent, particle size and moisture and things, but there's so much um, variability in the types of parts, the geometries, how tall it is, how small it is, how many parts you need to fit in there. And then obviously you need to make a business case out of it. And titanium is expensive. Some of these metal powders are expensive. So you're recycling. So like, how are you kind of spinning the plates to, to make sure that all worked and yeah. actually made a business at the end of it. <laughs> Absolutely. Right. So I think there are two parts of it. One is, um, you know, if you need to service everyone and anyone, you know, if someone comes to you saying that, Hey, I have this, this widget, which is super tall and super weird, but I just need one part. And another person like, here's this widget, which is small and I need just one part. I think that's where, um, you know, rapid prototyping comes in and a prototyping shop is what they would do. You know, one-offs, this is a crazy idea. We'll try it. But the moment you get into production, that's where the question of, hey, what are the production volumes that you care about? Is this going to be a recurring program? How much of runway? How much of, you know, what are your quality requirements and things like that? And, you know, there have been a lot of customers to where the answer is just no bid. Let, hey, we, you know, the, 
we've done the analysis, we've done all that kind of stuff. It just is just a no bid. So there are a lot of programs where the sheer amount of development that's needed um, that has to get done it may not make sense for the service bureau itself to do, and as a result, that you know that that onus might need to be taken on either by the customer themselves, and some of them do have internal capabilities, and that's what they're doing right now. They have engineers who are working on de-risking the use of AM for that particular part, for that particular program, and to generate like, you know, a technical data package and like a, you know, a to-do readme sheet that they can give the service bureau so that by the time it, it's, by the time it's ready to go to like low rate initial production, things are de-risked and the service bureau can just focus on implementing whatever is there in the sheet as opposed to figuring things out. In other cases that we've had customers come to EWI to help uh, de-risk some of that by doing some of the more riskier development aspects of it um, before it goes to service bureau. Like for example, we've had some customers come in and say that, hey, yeah, we've used the off the shelf parameters for this particular part, but then on these particular sections, we're seeing that there's a lot of uneven surface roughness distribution that we're seeing across the build platform. Can you help us figure out why it's there? And can you help us develop parameters or a strategy to get more uniform surface roughness across these parts? So that when I send it through my surface roughness elimination process, you know, whatever that process is, be it sandblasting or be it, you know, like electrolytic etching, I'm getting a uniform rate of removal and my parts are relatively, you know, consistent. So we've taken on some of those kind of de-risking projects as well. But in other cases, sometimes it's like, you know, the, the part isn't ready for production, no bed, <laughs> go, back to the, go back to the research table, you know, lock it down a little bit more and then bring it back. That's what I've seen. Um, but again, I think that a lot of the service bureaus today are, you know, way more equipped to be able to handle that, that kind of activity. And they have like, you know, in, in-house engineering capabilities, but you know, um, that's how, that's how I saw it back in the day. Um, I have no doubt that things might've changed by now. Yeah. And it's certainly still changing. I mean, there's been a lot of consolidation in the, certainly the metal side of oh, you know, yeah. service bureaus. It's, and, a, it's and a tough industry. It's, it's yeah. not easy. It's, it's, it's very, very tough. You know, because it's like a chicken and the egg kind of thing. You know, a big customer won't be willing to commit uh, a big multi-million dollar program to you uh, unless you show that I have that you have the capacity to be able to hold up or you know service that multi-million dollar program. But in order to have all that equipment and not have it, not enough uh, jobs running on it, not enough uh, machine uptime, then you're just bleeding money. So it's like a chicken and the egg. Right. And that's the interesting part. You know, there's a, there's a there are a couple of really large service bureaus and, you know, there's a lot of investment coming in. But no matter how big we say AM is, I still think it's a it's an industry that's still finding its feet. And, you know, there are a lot of people on the on the on the outside of AM right now who have a lot of money, you know, and an injection of like one billion dollars here and there, which is small for like, you know, the big PE firms and, and all the big companies that could completely change the the industry altogether, right? Could just tip the scales completely. So it's a very interesting thing to see right now. There's a lot of, you know, uh, companies on the market. There's a lot of different, you know, let's, I'm not going to say competing, or I guess they're all competing uh, to some extent from, from a machine architecture and technology perspective, but they're all really focused on the same thing. It kind of reminds me of, uh, you know, how back in the day when you had smartphones, and they try to differentiate themselves saying that, hey, my phone has three cameras, your phone has four cameras. Actually, no, even before that, my phone doesn't have a camera, but this phone does. And this and this one has a camera with the shutter. This one has an OLED screen. This and, and and you know, over the course of time, like these, you know, the individual features of these phones started coalescing and it became like a standard. Because now, unless you're you're making a phone for people who have absolutely do not want a camera on the phone, every single phone's gonna have a camera. <laughs> So things like that, I think we're going to be seeing that in the coming uh, years where a lot of the, you know, let's call it best practices in machine architecture and even software are going to start coalescing. We're going to start seeing more and more machines offering very, very similar things because those, those features that they're offering end up helping the customer. Right. Yeah, and it just helps to accelerate, right? The, a lot of the customers that we deal with, they're in the early stages of even selecting a technology, right? And even if you're, yeah. you know, it's DMLS or metal in general, like there's, there's so many dozens of things. options that you can go down Absolutely. and a lot of different answers. Some are, some are right, some are way wrong, but like there's, it's all kind of the, the engineering lingo where it depends. And, and that's... Absolutely. And I think that, you know, one thing is that's important to note is, and I think that a lot of people are knowing this, that, you know, there's so many metal AM technologies and, and I don't think that there is one silver bullet technology for every single application. It really depends on 
what the part geometry is, what the um, the current way it's being manufactured, um, how that part uh, you know fits into the larger assembly if it does fit into a larger assembly, um, what kind of throughput and production volumes they actually require. Because depending on those questions itself, you know, a couple of the metal AM processes just get eliminated, right? And and that's that's one aspect, like you know. Re- ranking the technologies on the basis of their actual technical capability. But then there's an entire business aspect saying that, hey, if I, you know, if I want to you know, print a part out of Arc DED, how many Arc DED service beers are there, right? Yeah. There aren't that many. And if I have like, you know, a big program where supply chain resiliency is like the number one problem that I'm contending with, and there's only like one supplier for this part, then I'm in big trouble. So I think twice before immediately committing to send it. So there's always, there's going to be a balance of like the technology has to mature you know, to reduce the number of, as I call them, conditions apply statements associated with, you know, a part, like saying that, yeah, we could print it, but you're going to have to surface finish it, but you're going to have to heat treat it, but you're going to have to do this. The more, as technology gets better and better, I think that those conditions apply statements are going to go down. And over the course of time, hopefully, as the market expands, there'll be more service providers and, you know, there'll be more suppliers in general. It'll be a bit more robust which means that, you know, the folks that be on the supply chain side of these large companies or the large customers, they'll be like, yeah, yeah, you know, I think AM is ready. Let's, you know, inject right. <laughs> $10 million production, go. <laughs> For sure. And hopefully at, at some point it becomes less expensive to make production, get to production, right? Like oh, where, if the machine is a million itself you, and that's 20% of the process where you need heat treating, you need all the material stuff that goes into it. Um, there's, oh gosh, there's a lot like, of upfront costs and it's very, uh, a little bit of a black art. At the moment. The, yeah. The number of programs that I've seen that have tanked, um, you know, like the printing isn't even necessarily the biggest problem. The printing part's the easy part. I think the post-processing is where a lot of the bottlenecks come in, be it in machining, be it in heat treat, be it in like, you know, getting the right surfaces, preventing distortion. That's where a lot of programs just die on the vine because getting the printing part, I think that's, you know, a lot of places are doing it and they're doing it right, but the post-processing is a real, real issue. Absolutely. And it requires a lot of, you know, a, a lot of work. Like there's a lot of work on the post-processing side that needs to get figured out. Some of that post-processing can be eliminated through like better technology, better pro- like, you know, better parameters, better, you know, scan strategies, better path planning strategies, things like that, better materials. But there's some things which, you know, the, the post-processing industry, which has been really built to service castings and forgings, they like there is some adaptation which is required and like you know upgrading which is needed. And so you spent a number of years, or I guess like let's go on keep going on your career path. So you're at you're doing a grad grad program. You're also kind of moonlighting as a materials engineer <laughs> and you're exactly. limited so- free time. So what, what's <laughs> what's what's happening there? So yeah, so um Finishing doing grad school and doing and acting as a materials engineer at, at, at Encodum and 3D. Graduated in 2018, and then I continued on um, till uh, 2020, uh, like December. Sorry, what was it? It was January 2020, correct? And then I, I uh, heard about an opportunity at EWI. Um, so I, I knew about I knew about EWI because of their additive manufacturing consortium, and I think Mark, Mark Barfoot's been on this podcast before, and, and he, he's basically running the consortium. So I've been part of the consortium as a member, basically as a customer, and uh, that kind of piqued my interest. And I thought that they were doing really cool work. Found out that they had an opening, and basically um, I was hired like uh, almost in a jiffy, <laughs> and that happened really quick. So joined EWI as an applications engineer. Um, and, you know, within a month of joining, got promoted to the title of research leader. And effectively, right now, I uh, lead our research and development activities, our technology road mapping, along with our senior technology leader. Um, and on the other side, I basically own our laser powder bit fusion uh, practice at the moment. So I have three machines and I have a couple of engineers, and we do a lot of research and development on a day-to-day basis, but also a lot of, like, you know, um, call it, like, consulting work, but basically we're doing a lot of actual research and development for customers. You know, customers have problems. Uh, you know, some folks want to try out new lasers. Some folks want better parameters. Some folks want to understand the effect of, you know, corrosion on these printed parts. Um, some folks are just need, they need help developing an application. Um, in other cases, we're doing work related to closed loop control. So just uh, all over the, all over the, the, the space. So it's like consulting where it's really fast paced. You're learning a lot of things, but over here it's like consulting, but you're actually doing a lot of 
hardcore um, hands-on engineering work. So it's like engineering bootcamp. It's great. <laughs> so how much of that role, I mean, I run a consulting company and, and so like part of it's the engineering side, but also are most companies coming like given the heritage of EWI, are you, you have the consortium. So that's kind of the marketing where you're driving business, but like, how does a, like, what's, how does a project typically get birthed in, in, in your world? Yeah. Okay. So basically I think that um, there, there are a couple of ways, right? One, I would call these reactive projects, which come in our way saying that, Hey, someone has a problem. They know that we can, we might have resources, which can solve it based off of some, you know, um, presentation that we did six months ago or a light paper that we published on the market. They're like, Hey, can we, can you help us out? So that's kind of reactive. Then there's proactive stuff where we have, you know, because we have equipment and when we're not doing project work, the equipment's there. So we do a lot of research and development. So what we're not doing when we're billing is research and development. So the machines running machines and generating results and we target the research that we're doing to, um, try and fill certain gaps that we're seeing in the industry at the moment, right? Certain areas that we're feeling that, hey, you know, this is a good space that where our capabilities match with the gap in the industry. So we're going to go generate some results and potentially develop some IP or develop a, a service or a solution that we can definitely, that we can go and then approach customers with, and then, you know, pitch an idea saying that, hey, you know, um, we know that you're working in this particular space. We know that you want to apply AM to manufacture these components. We understand that this particular problem, be it a surface uh, finish problem or, or a you know, hydrogen induced cracking problem or a uh, you know, solidification cracking problem is something that you're contending with. Here is a solution that we've developed that we think uh, might be of value to your organization. And then we get them interested, chat with them. And then you know, if it works out well, proposal, and then they, you know, they cut us a check and then we, we're off to the races trying to develop a solution for them. Right, so there's reactive and proactive selling. The sales cycles are obviously different because you know some of the reactive stuff just keeps coming in, and that's a, a function of how out there, you, how, how how like how you know uh, how market facing we are, I guess, how how well seen in the industry we are. And then the proactive parts of it is where it's a bit longer term because we actually have to do the research, actually do some development, actually get some results, make sure that we're not fooling ourselves. And then go and generate a uh, you know a, a plan around that. So like one a recent one that we did was related to um, uh, some work that we did where we uh, developed some IP uh, related to uh, you know it's called we call it laser stirring. So instead of doing linear hatches and laser powder bit fusion, we actually uh, st make the laser go in a stirring pattern. And this is based off of some work in the 80s where that, that uh, one of our uh, you know, senior technology leaders in the materials group did on, on, in, on the welding side, where he did magnetic stirring of the weld pool to kind of break up uh, columnar grain growth. And we were like, hey, let's just try applying something similar on laser powder bit fusion to kind of break up the columnar grains. And so we did that on a variety of materials, and we actually have a white paper out there. Um, and we got some really interesting results. So getting that from an idea to actually a mini result to something that we're engaging with customers on that they actually want to come to us with has been like a, it has been a process, but that's kind of part of the proactive selling that we do, you know, looking forward saying that, Hey, right now with powder bit fusion, you know, industrial levels of adoption are high. Um, you know, there are a lot of materials on the shelf, but then there's still many more materials and applications which are inaccessible because right now they're using forging grade alloys or they're using, you know, high gamma prime crack prone alloys. How do we unlock that entire part of the market? And one way to do that is either by tailoring the material, which some folks are doing, but for customers where who are in a situation where you can't adjust the material composition, can we do something on the process side? Can we make the process a bit more amenable for those kind of alloys, for those kind of compositions? So that's part of how we do it. So even over here at, with, with my group, like our folk, we have three main focuses, like materials development, process development, and, and, and you know improving quality through in-situ process monitoring. So... That's how, kind of how I, I would boil it down. Yeah. Yeah. And let's dive into some of the, I mean, we we're talking a little bit about the um, kind of trends you're seeing in terms of a, a lot of the work, a lot of the work you do is in that last one kind of in situ monitoring and, and how do you think about moving this from a, like, how do you get it into production wide, wide adoption? Do you want to just, let's chat about that for a few minutes, kind of what is in situ monitoring? What does it mean? Like, why is it important for um, for the industry as we stand today. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great point. So I think that part of it is, you know, with uh, um, with with AM, right? 
um, the way I, way I look at like to look at it is just but or let's you know with, with most fusion based AM processes right be it you know DED or even powder bit fusion be it electron or, or laser powder bit fusion really what you're doing is you're creating a melt pool and you're stitching one melt pool to the next melt pool and then you're building a part by superimposing all these melt pools one on top of the other so literally it's just a big weld now in traditional welding metallurgy and traditional welds people are like oh yeah you have to make sure that your weld looks good so how do we do it one way is to do the weld test out the parameters and make sure that you know uh your your, your welder let's say this is that the welder's name is diane that diane has a steady hand and diane you know uh, is, is is well and diane is able to hold that electrode very steadily and then it may, has a good weld and then they cut up that weld and they look at it and they're like yeah this this looks good with powder bit fusion it's kind of similar where you need to make sure that the machine's behaving and that the machine is producing quality uh metal every single uh step of the way and because it's on it's it's continuously running and it's going on and you have so many unit operations the chances of a defect happening go up even if the relative probability is low there's so many unit operations that the chances of you getting a stochastic process defect are going up and we see this right we see that even with really really good parameters that you, where you've built a density cube and you're like yes it's 99.95% dense and you know it's stable across the build platform when you build a part things happen and yes you know you kind of drift outside that you know as i call it the the optimal process window and 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 your process kind of teeters so having um you know getting smarter with the use of sensors to look at your process um to understand what's really going on as well as to tell us if something is going wrong is, is step number one right so step number one is understanding hey the process is happening if i'm seeing something that tells me that there's a huge defect which is irreparable um you know at the uh, at a critical region of the part i'm just better off junking the build right now rather than you know printing the entire part and then realizing that it's junk and that's one way of looking at it another way of looking at it which is a little bit more like you know which is where i think things are going is have i identified the defect do i know what defect it is and then can i devise a way to rectify or or take care of it right? Yeah. Can I identify the defect? Do I know which defect it is, what caused it and where it is most importantly, because if some of these defects are really small and you're, and you're kind of putting all of your eggs in the CT basket saying that, Hey, I'm going to CT scan this. It's like looking for a needle in a haystack. And you know, that's another bottleneck that you have to contend with. So for Institute process monitoring to get a little bit smarter, I think that, you know, it, it's going to need to be integrated seamlessly with your entire process so that while your process is going on, while the scanning is going on, you know, your sensors are collecting data and depending on which sensor you're using, you're collecting different types of data, which tell you about different types of defects, right? There is no silver bullet. Hey, this sensor will tell you everything you need to know. To be very honest, there are a multitude of sensors which are needed for different types of defects and the different types of defects depend on what application it is, what material it is and what you're most worried about. So that's kind of where I, I would say that, you know, Institute Process Monitoring starts. And I think that the future is definitely going to be um, related to you know, identifying the defect with a particular sensor, um, understanding what the issue is, and then real time or, you know, in a feed forward manner, correcting that defect, you know, in a closed loop control or a feed or, or an open loop controlled manner. Because the future has to be where the machine knows whether it's operating correctly, the machine knows whether you're producing good material and is correcting itself, you know, over the course of time. And I definitely think that's where things need to go to reduce the amount of individual operator intervention and the number of like trial and error uh, situations. For sure. And, and we're starting to see that too. I mean, like one of the big challenges we've had over the last couple of decades is that we're trying to find what applications does this technology work for and how does that material line up and what's the geometry. And you're starting to see a little bit of that custom, well, machines made for specific purposes or specific oh, industries, specific um, parts and geometry. So that makes like it a little bit easier so that you're not doing a heat sink one day and a very hollow tube the, the next day. And, and so like, you know, a little bit of, it's like one of those things, like you, you practice something the same over and over again, you know where it's likely to fail. And Absolutely. that makes your like monitoring or whatever you're doing a little bit easier. Absolutely. I completely agree with you. You know, the early days of AM were where, you know, the, the entire premise was, hey, here's a box that you can f give any CAD geometry to, and this box will print you the part, right? You can throw anything at it and it'll print it. And that's great for certain use cases, for certain, you know, uh, certain types of parts and for certain 
uh, types of companies which try to use it. But when we're trying to think about AM being used for production, production really cares about quality and throughput. So now we're seeing where machines are really being geared towards um, being able to produce as many parts of a particular type as possible, as quickly as possible, and with as high quality as possible. And like, you know, we're seeing that where some systems, you know, they now are based off of existing platforms, uh, you know, like AMCM, right? And they, they took an MT90, they increased the, the height of the build platform, and now they're printing rocket engines with it, right? And that's a precise example of where you are having, you know, machine modifications tailored towards a specific component. And as, you know, the value of these individual AM components go up, right, where people realize, hey, I'm going to combine even more parts of my assembly together to make this component, the value of the component increases. So the allowable value of the machine used to make the component can go up as well because they're all tied together. Um, so I think that that's definitely where things are going. Um, and, you know, be it with whichever AM technology you're using, you know, be it Powderbit Fusion or DED, whatever, at the end of the day, it's a means to an end. It's just a manufacturing method. So as we've seen, you know, in, in other industries where, you know, machining is a manufacturing method. So you might have a custom machining setup to be able to machine parts out super fast. Like, I mean, if I had to, you know, drill, a, if, I, if, if one step of my operation was just to tap a hole, I wouldn't need to buy a five axis CNC machine to tap a hole. I would just have that hole tap, that, that drill mounted as part of my, my, my production line. Right. And I think that we need to start thinking about that, thinking about AM that way and start questioning these, these fundamental assumptions that, oh, it has to be in a box. Oh, it has to be in our atmosphere, things like that. So that's kind of the areas that um, my group is looking into, like at questioning some of these, uh, these, these assumptions that, hey, does it really need to be in an inner atmosphere? What if I'm just printing a, a low carbon steel? You know, it doesn't have to be super fancy stuff, but does it really need to be in a, in a closed box, right? Obviously, soot generation and stuff is, is important. You know, there's powder. So asking those questions is going to be important to be able to generate the, you know, develop the next generation of, uh, you know, manufacturing processes and equipment, right? <laughs> this entire thing's evolving. Speaking of kind of next generation, kind of what are your thoughts and advice to folks that are kind of thinking about manufacturing as a career and maybe more specifically added manufacturing? Yeah, no, I think AM is such a cool spot. You know, like if for folks who are, who aren't convinced yet, like think, you know, 50 years from now, if you need to print like the Death Star, or the Star Destroyer in space, it's probably going to be like a huge DED cell. Um, which is which is just printing in space, and instead of using like you know welding wire, it's going to be using like wire the thickness of like rail steel. Think about that, right? That that that's the that's the size of the opportunity that that exists in front of you. Um, AM AM is such a cool space because it's it's you know it's no longer the I guess it's still kind of the wild west uh, to some extent where there's a lot of innovation happening. There's a lot of uh, new new companies with innovative ideas mushrooming. Um, I think that it, it's definitely led to like a renaissance and of, of, of interest in manufacturing and materials engineering in general. And it's very interdisciplinary, right? Like I have a degree in material science, but based off the work that I do, I think I kind of bounce anywhere between like data science, control systems, you know, optics and lasers, uh, you know, uh, traditional materials engineering design. It's just all over the place, right? It's a great place to build an interdisciplinary skill set. And, and one advice I'd give to um, AM engineers is, um, you know, it's good to know how to operate a piece of equipment, but operating a piece of equipment does not count as a very transferable skill set because that equipment will get old, that equipment will get obsolete. So it's more important to understand the, you know, one level above of what's going on and have ideas about how you can make things better and how you can improve, you know, the throughput, improve the quality. I think that that would be very, very valuable. For sure. I think that's great advice. So. Ajay, thank you so much for joining the show today. I look forward to running into you at future conferences and uh, keeping up to date on all the work you're doing at EWI. Awesome. Thanks, Mike. Had a pleasure. See ya.